I hope accepted our apologies and uh, agreed to come back down to give us a, a talk again today in a more appropriate setting. And so we hope all of you give him uh, your attentive ears. So I'll, I won't run through the full uh, five again, which you all have in your program. But essentially, Andrew Lung is the first Vietnamese American writer to make it into mainstream publications. Um, and so I think his personal story is very significant, but also you know, the quality of his work, if you haven't had a chance to read it yet, I would highly, highly recommend it. Uh, his latest book is called Perfume Dreams, uh, Reflection from the Dice World, uh, and uh, it's available uh, afterwards if uh, any of you would like an autographed copy. But um, in any case, without further ado, I please ask you to give a warm, warm welcome to Mr. Andrew Lum. I'm back by a popular apology. <laughs> um, well, I had a suit yesterday for it, and uh, and it was not the right place. And today I'm dressing up. I'm looking for my makeup as I was asleep. <laughs> so bear with me. Um, I was just start reading from the book, uh, seconds from it, um, as a way to uh, sort of fill in the blank from yesterday, since uh, I too was looking forward to the dance. Uh, of the young woman in the skinky dresses. Um, <laughs> hey, I'm old, but I can still dream, right? <laughs> um, I'll read the first section, um, and then I'll just go around uh, the book and read fragments from it. Um, in, instead of telling you about myself, the book will. <clears throat> when I was 11 years old, I did an unforgivable thing. I set my family photos on fire. We were living in Saigon at the time, and as Viet Cong drove over the edge of the city, my mother, half crazed with fear, ordered me to get rid of everything incriminating. Obediently, I removed pictures from the album pages, diplomas from their glass frames, film reels from metal canisters, letters from desk drawers. I put them all in a pile in the backyard and lit a match. When I was done, the mementos of three generations had turned into ashes. Only years later in America did I begin to regret the act. A few pictures survived because my older brother, who was a foreign student, had taken them with him. But why didn't I save the rest the way I slipped my stamp collection in my backpack hours before we boarded the C-130 and headed for Guam? For years, I could not look at friends' family photo albums without feeling remorse. Then last week, I had a dream that was so instructive it left me with a different estimation of that loss. In the dream, I found myself once more in front of my old home in Saigon. I walked through the rusted iron gate to find, to my horror, the place gutted, an empty structure where once there was life and love. Immediately start to run along the pile, broken bricks and fallen plasters, finding at last a nightstand that once belonged to my mother. I pull, I destroy, and I'll spill dozens of black and white photos. I am ecstatic. The photos are intact. They are exactly as I remember them. Here's one of my brother when he was 12, wearing his martial arts uniform and bowing to camera. Here's one of my mother as a teenager, posing next to the ruins of Angkor Wat. Here is my father as a young and handsome colonel, smoking a cigar, and me and my sister holding on to our dogs, Midoa and Nina, as we wave to the photographer, smiling happily. Suddenly, a little boy appears in the dream. This is my home, he yells, and you are trespassing. But these are my photos, I meekly protest. The boy looks at me with a mixture of suspicion and shrewdness and changes his tone. Well, he says, how much would you give me for these photos? But before I can find the answer, he laughs and snatches the photos out of my hand, out of wrap back and closes it. I walk to find my arm still reaching out over the blanket in a gesture toward the pictures, still trying to retrieve them. Confused, I stare at my own empty hand for what seemed to be a long, long time. In that salty dawn with the cable car rumbling up and down the hills and the bells clanging merrily outside my window, I saw what I hadn't seen before. 
that nothing was ever truly lost. What I failed to retrieve in the dream survived, if only as an exquisite longing. If words and language, as the poet Rilke tells us, can be made into a thing, mute as the statue of an orator, I think reverse is true also. Precious things lost are transmutable. They refuse oblivion. They simply wait to be rendered into testimonies, into stories and songs. Now, this segment is all about my relationship with other language memories. Um, and uh, it's a little bit personal that all my writing seems to be like that in this book. Um, all right. On April 28, 1975, two days before Saigon fell to the Communist Army and the Vietnam War ended, my family and I boarded a cargo plane for the panic refugees and headed for Guam. I remember watching Vietnam recede into the cloudy horizon from the plane's window, a green mass of land giving way to a hazy green sea. I was 11 years old. I was confused, frightened, and from all available evidence, the khaki army tents in the bomb refugee camp, the scorching heat, the long lines for food ration, I was also homeless. Places and time when they can no longer be retrieved tend to turn sacrosanct. Home forever lost is forever based in a certain twilight glow. After so many years in America, my mother still longed for the ancestral altar on which grandpa's faded photo and black and white photos stare into our uh, abandoned home. She missed the carved rosewood cabinet in which she's kept the enamel cover, family albums, and father's special French wines from Bordeaux. She fretted over the small farm we owned near the Bin Lai Bridge outside of on Saigon, where the chickens roamed freely and the mangosteen and guava trees were heavy with fruits when we last visited, and where the river, dotted with water hyacinths, ran swift and strong. This is the time of year when the guavas back home arrived, and mother would tell family at dinner time. So far from home, mother nevertheless took her reference points in autumn, her favorite season. Autumn, the dark season, came in the form of letters she received from, from relatives and friends left behind. Brown and flimsy, thin like dead leaves, recycled for who knows how many times, the letters threatened to dissolve with a single tear. They unanimously told of tragic lives. Auntie and her family barely survived. The cousin is caught for the umpteen time trying to escape. Uncle has died from heart failure while being interrogated by a Viet Cong. Yet another uncle is indefinitely incarcerated in the malaria infested re education camp. And no news yet of cousin and family who disappeared to South China Sea. The letters went on to inquire as to our health and then to intimately ask for money, for an antibiotic, for a bicycle, and if possible, for sponsorship to America. The letters confirmed what my mother who lived through two wars, had always known life is a sea of suffering and sorrow gives meaning to life. Then, as if to anger me in old world tragedy, as if to bind me to that shared narrative of loss and misery, mother insisted on to read those letters. What did I do? I, I skipped, I shrugged, I put on a poker face and raked autumn in a pile and pushed it all back to her. That country, I slowly announced in English, as if to wound, is cursed. That country, mind you, no longer mine. Vietnam was now so far away, an abstraction, and America was now so near, outside the window, blaring on TV, written on, in the science fiction books I devoured like mad, a seduction. Besides, what could a scrawny refugee teenager living in America do to save Ungo from that malaria-infested re-education camp? What could he do for cousin and her family lost somewhere in the vast South China Sea? He could, on the other hand, pretend amnesia to save himself from grief. My mother made that clucking sound of disapproval with her tongue as she shook her head. She looked into my eyes and called me the worst thing she could think of. 
you become a little American now, haven't you? So cowboy, a cowboy. Vietnamese appropriated the word cowboy from the movies to imply selfishness. A cowboy in Vietnamese estimation is the robber who has in the spaghetti western leaves town, the communal life, to ride alone into the sunset. Mother's comment smarted, but she wasn't far from the truth. Her grievances against America had little to do with the war and the United States involvement in it. Her complaint against America was that it had stolen her children, especially her youngest and once most filial son. America seduced him with its optimism, twisted his thinking, bent his tongue, and dulled his tropic memories. America gave him freeways and fast food and silly cartoons and sitcoms, imbuing him with sappy, happy ending incitements. Yet, it could not be helped. For the refugee child in America, the world splits perversely into two irreconcilable parts, inside and outside. Inside, at home, in the crowded apartment shared by two refugee families, nostalgia rule. Inside, the world remained dedicated to what was. Remember the house we used to live in, with the red roof and burial wavering over the iron gate? Remember when we used to sail down the way of the Fume River for the night market, and that night the sky was full of stars? Remember that when Uncle showed us that trick with the cards? Inside, the smell of fish sauce wafted along with the smell of incense from the newly built altar that housed photos of the dead, a complex smell of loss. Inside, the refugee father told and retold wartime stories to his increasingly disaffected children, reliving the battles that he had fought and won. He stirred his whiskey and soda on ice and stared blankly at the TV. Inside, the refugee mother grieved for lost relatives, lost home and hearth, lost ways of life, a whole cherished world of intimate connection, gone, scattered, uprooted, gone, gone, all gone. And so inside, I, the refugee child, felt the collective weight of history on my shoulders and fell asleep. Outside, however, what do you want to be when you grow up, Mr. K, the English teacher in eighth grade asked. I had never thought of the question before, such an American question, but it intrigued me. I did not hesitate. A movie star, I answered laughing. Outside, I was ready to believe, to swear that Vietnamese child who grew up in that terrible war and who saw many strange, tragic, and marvelous things was someone else, not me. That it had happened in another age centuries ago. That Vietnamese boy never grew up, he wandered still in that garden of my childhood memory, whereas I, I had gone on that night. It was a feeling that I could not help. I came to America at a peculiar age, pubescent and not fully formed. Old enough to remember Vietnam, I was also young enough to embrace America and to be shaped by it. Outside in school, among new friends, I spoke English freely and deliberately. I whispered sweet compliments to Chinese and Filipino girls and made them blush. I cussed and joked with friends and made them laugh. I bantered and cavorted with teachers and made myself their pet. Speaking English, I had a markedly different personality than when speaking Vietnamese. In English, I was a sunny, upbeat, silly, and sometimes wickedly sharp-tongued kid. No sorrow, no sadness, no cataclysmic grief clung to my new language. A wild river full of possibilities flowed effortlessly from my tongue, connecting me to the new world, and I, enamored by the discovery of a new, the invented self, I sailed its iridescent waters. Holy Spring. Um, you all know what a big deal is, and I'm sure some of you have visited and uh, gone back to Let's see your hands so we have gone back to Big Bang. Wow! Okay. Um, I've been back many times, but this segment is about me coming back for the first time in 1991, and um, it's in the chapter 12 BQ, and I'm just going to read a part of it uh, about my impression uh, of being a BQ in Vietnam almost 15 years ago. Let's see. The 
Spanish street vendor that cannot study is my eyes, my lips. Brother, he says, yours is not a Vietnamese face. It's a face that has not known suffering. That he adds through a sigh. Had I escaped to America, maybe I too would have such a face, a Vietnamese face. In Vietnam, my face and body takes on, take on mythological proportions. When a cousin proudly introduces me to a friend, someone who has tried a dozen times in vain to escape, the man promptly reaches over and squeezes my thigh. I have no doubt that this is an impersonal gesture. Good visions of double-tier freeways and classy high-rises are to be extracted out of the vehicle's flesh. Squeeze a little harder and who knows, you might just say Disneyland. <laughs> At the dinner time, at the dinner party thrown in my honor by my relatives in Hanoi, people ask me to explain the intricacies of virtual reality, American foreign policy in the Middle East, and while I'm at it, genetic engineering. Actually, I could explain genetic engineering. Um, <laughs> you know, but anyway, they think my odd Americanized Vietnamese accent is perfectly charming. At another party, my American passport is read like a comic book by my various relatives. As the entry and exit stands of Greece, France, Mexico, Thailand, and a dozen other countries flutter past my cousin's eyes, she looks up at me and declares dreamily, Cousin, such happiness is as if you had wings. Indeed, in the, in the last 3,000 years or so, it was generally understood that a Vietnamese soul is tied to home and hearth. In the last few decades, a new idea has subverted the poetry of insularity, escape. In the decades that followed the end of the war, Vuc Binh, escape from Vietnam, has probably crossed every Vietnamese mind. As it is, Vietnamese nationalism, that firebrand weapon that defeated the Chinese, Mongolians, French, and Americans, seems to have withered in its old age. While elderly, these leaders continue to emphasize the final points of collective strength, citing memories of war against the invaders, the young of Vietnam have moved away from a parochial us versus them mentality. If Ho Chi Minh, the father of Vietnamese communism, once preached independence and freedom to his compatriots, today it's the big deal. Those like me and my family, persecuted by Ho's followers and forced to escape overseas, who, upon return, exude freedom and independence. As a big deal, I am often not an individual but of too many an icon against hopelessness, a character who took the high road and who, whose life many can live vicariously. Familiarity and constant interactions over the last few years have diminished the awe and glamour, but there is still an expectation here that a big kill where he willing could fulfill many and impoverished Vietnamese wish list. I am, for example, mistaken on the streets of Vietnam for Santa Claus. One afternoon, a 12-year-old street urchin named Dung nonchalantly asked if I might adopt him and send him to school. A young woman named Foom, her face deformed by a skin disease, also begs for help. Brother, you can perform a miracle, pay for my operation. And how many times, I wonder, have complete strangers, officials, rickshaw drivers, shop owners, ex big gong gorillas, offer me their daughter's hand in marriage. In the old quarter of Hanoi, my aunt-in-law's neighbor, a young piano teacher, develops a crush on me. The aunt, who invited me to stay at her home, whispers, Matthew, be careful. That I had answered, yes, I do like Chopin, was clearly for the music teacher a declaration of romance. <laughs> Chopin's holidays in various keys in due course echoes for hours from next door each afternoon, riding the humid air to my bedroom window. In Vietnam as a child, I remember being moved by the national anthem that emphasized the sacrifice to protect the sacred land. I remember feeling inspiration and awe staring at rice and rice field at dusk. But that, as they say, was a life a long time ago. For me, as well as for many other Vietnamese of my generation, those birth ties were severed and our innocence died the day we crossed the ocean to distant shores. Returning today, an odd gap appears between my country and me. If I am some archetype of Vietnam's new narrative of itself, a modern-day Odysseus of sorts, someone that those who stay imagine they can become if they were to flee overseas, I feel a stranger in my own homeland. 
Vietnam is an 18-hour flight from San Francisco, but it is also an impossible journey. The train does and does not take me home again. Or rather, I go home again, but the country of my childhood memories is long gone, replaced by a collective yearning of possibilities beyond the provincial. In Vietnam, there is a movie called People's Love, made by a Vietnamese director about a Viet Kiều, the first film on the subject. It belongs to the definition of Viet Kiều, the patriotic Viet Kiều. In the movie, a Vietnamese-American doctor, disillusioned with American life, returns home to find love and redemption. Such is the predictable sentimental script funded by the state. It drew very few viewers. I think the unfolding Vietnamese epic is closer to the reverse. Vietnam's infants died with the birth of the Viet Kiều, the birth of the Vietnamese diaspora. Vietnamese tourist century romance is not with land, river, or rice field, but with memory, with cosmopolitan and borderless life. Still, I can no more deny my own sense of displacement in the new Vietnam than I can I deny my role in the new Vietnamese imagination. No wings sprouts from my back, but I have nonetheless brought the boom to my own homeland. Myself, I am evidence that the outside world exists. It's about accent. I came to America at a very weird age where I was suffering cultural shock along with going through puberty. And it's a very bizarre thing since my parents never told me about puberty. Um, and when my voice broke, uh, and as I was learning English, my brother told me uh, that uh, mom and dad told you not to speak English so much in the house and you just obey, so that's why you shot your vocal cord. <laughs> and I, for about a period of six months to a year really believed him because no one told me. And, and I, I, was in, uh, I was mourning for Vietnam, for the lost country and everything else, and I was mourning for my voice because everyone said I sounded like a duck. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> but it was a strange thing because, you know, you go through puberty and, and uh, you're learning a new language, and, and the two things really somehow affected me, I think, that's why I talked, because in part of me, I was reading, but also I was really amazed that if you can speak a new language and actually change it, not just your identity, but change it physiologically. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, in a way, I thought English was like incantation, like magic spells, you know? Um, and, and even though my friends you know, explained it to me, that impression stays with me. It stays with me in a way that I think that's why I became a writer, because I, I'm more to feel that in awe of language and how it can change you. Um, and anyway, this is about accent. That's why I told you that story. <laughs> Um, my father was a studious man. He arrived in America from Vietnam at the age of 44, but was nevertheless, oh, but nevertheless, to re educate himself. He went to school nightly, got a gift, and then, through her killing efforts, graduated from law school. But that was when things started to fall apart on him. Uncle Chuck's accent was so thick that none of his interviews proved fruitful. No one wanted to hire him, not even as a paralegal. After a dozen or so interviews, he gave up. The very of like suggestion accent, he would tell me bitterly. Americans were deaf even to foreign accents. You know you were a massive sound like a foreigner. I already knew as much. Although I was 11 when I came here and then I'm comfortable with the language, whenever I get nervous with my accent things. It's a back in my great English class and forced me to pass it to I can still hear the tipping points as I stumble over to passages, not understanding the word. So I practiced and practiced and practiced. Every morning in shower, as I got ready for school, I would open my mouth and enunciate certain words learned the day before, listening to their vibrations against the towel. This is pronounced chest I was shut. Necessary! I almost see the words with the sharp edges and round arches taking shape in the steamy air. I would try my best to rule over them. But I also knew that it was far harder to bend my tongue to accommodate the American ear than to assimilate. My uncle, for instance, was not rejected for lacking qualifications. He was unruly tongue that gave his words away, pronouncing interminably alien and unfortunately unloyal role. Uncle never found a satisfying job. After a while, he resorted to working in his wife's grocery store in Mission District in San Francisco and smoking, drinking himself to death. 
He believed in the American dream, Golden Door shut on him at the last minute. On that advantage, my brother canceled. Uncle Tho whispered in other words and gasped for air. It's been more than a decade now since he passed away. I think of him sometimes at cocktail parties and conferences. I try to enunciate my words carefully, masking my words with my cowboy accent. In the back of my mind, I was warning, speak like Connie Chung and you're okay. Talk like me and you end up running a grocery store. And the other day, I took a friend to a Chinese restaurant in San Francisco, and the waiter, newly arrived from Hong Kong, told us to take a table to the night. I didn't pronounce the art in the word right. Short my stickers, and who gave to me? A free torch that reminded Uncle Tu on his deathbed, and I was suddenly overwhelmed by intense sadness. Cindy, I whispered to her, Listen, I have something to tell you. As she said, as she leaned over and combed back over to hear me divulge my secrets, but I had nothing to say. Instead, I did something that left both in shock. I leaned over, stuck out my tongue, and swiftly licked her ear. <laughs> you can laugh, you want to. <laughs>